and welcome to the Vaults of Terror. My name is Ed, and today we're going to be looking into the continuation of our Space Marine biology videos by looking at the Space Marine's implantation process, which takes a normal human being and transforms them into the superhuman Space Marines. Now, it takes a considerable amount of time to transform a human into a Space Marine. They receive gene seed implantations, which change them from a standard person into the aforementioned Space Marine, and it makes them able to do many different things, such as spit acidic venom, absorb the memories of the dead by eating their flesh, lovely, darkening their skins to protect it from radiation, and operating for very long periods of time without sleep by switching off parts of their brain. Prior to being implanted with the gene seed, recruits are subjugated to psycho-indoctrination and conditioning to strengthen their resolve and hone them into a dedicated and merciless warrior. Not all recruits survive this brutal training, but once they have, it proves that they are ready to be tested and implanted with the gene seed of their new chapter. Now, to be selected for implantation and training, the recruits must be chosen from the best warriors in humanity. Naturally, this makes Death Worlds and Feral Worlds a heavy recruitment area for Space Marine chapters. However, hive worlds are also considered ideal as a source of potential recruits. Whole hive gangs are sometimes hunted down and captured for recruitment. Now, the most valued traits in a recruit are aggression and psychotic level killer instinct, which in human society is generally considered a bad thing. But when you become a space marine, these sort of traits are required in order to make you the perfect warrior for the Imperium. Now, civilised worlds are rarely recruited from, however there are examples of recruitment from these areas, such as the Ultramarines homeworld of Ultramar, which has a heavy recruitment process for the Space Marine chapters. Now, the requirements for the implantation process are numerous, and I'll only mention a few here. Primarily, recruits need to be young, as the implants often do not become fully functional if the recipient has reached a certain level of physical maturity. Now, they must be male, because the zygotes are aligned to male hormones and tissue types, such as testosterone. Only a small percentage of boys are compatible to receive the implants and hypno-indoctrination, which will then turn them into marines. Even once the organs are implanted into a potential marine, they are mostly inactive or useless without the associated training and hypnotherapy and chemical treatments. Most recruits join the ranks as a brother between the ages of 16 and 18 after the long period of their implantation. Now, as mentioned in my previous video, there are 19 organs which are meant to be implanted into a recruit to make them into a space marine. Now, these are highly advanced pieces of genetic manipulation, and because of this, they only work properly if they are in the presence of one or all of the other implants. Now, if removal or mutation happens to one of the organs, it can affect the precise functioning of all the other organs in a recruit or, in fact, marine's body. Because of this, and the fact that the chapter's gene seed belongs to the chapter alone, different chapters display different characteristics and use different sets of implants and methods of implantation in order to stabilise their gene seed. Throughout the implantation process, marines must undergo various forms of conditioning in order for the implanted organs to develop and become part of their physiology. This tableau is a complete set of the implants used and the phases of implantation which a neophyte would receive their implants. Now, phases 1 to 3 can be introduced at the same time, ideally between the ages of 10 and 14 years of age. Phases 4 and 5 can be introduced at the same time as phases 1 through 3, and are ideally implanted between the ages of 12 and 14. Hypnotherapy normally begins at phase 6, ideally sometime between the ages of 14 and 17 years of age. Phases 7 and 9 are normally introduced simultaneously, ideally at a point between the ages of 14 and 16 years old. The following series of organs are also ideally implanted between the ages of 14 and 16. Phases 14 and 15 may be introduced at the same time, ideally between the ages of 15 and 16 years of age. The remaining series of implants are then ideally introduced to the recipient between the ages of 16 and 18. Now I'll go on to mention the organs and the implantation phase that they are a part of. Now the secondary heart is part of phase 1, and now this is the simplest and most self-sufficient of the implants, and this allows a space marine to survive his primary heart being damaged or destroyed, and to survive in low oxygen environments as well. Not only is it a backup, the secondary heart can also boost the blood flow around a space marine's body, increasing the blood oxygen level and allowing for more strenuous activity over a longer period of time. Next up in phase 2 is the osomodular. Now it's a small complex tubular organ and it secretes hormones that both affect the ossification of the skeleton, which means the growth of a skeleton, and encourages the forming bones to absorb ceramic based chemicals that are a part of a space marine's diet. This alters the way a space marine's bones grow and develop. Two years after this implant is put into a subject, the long bones of the marine, the arms and legs, will have increased in size and strength, along with most other bones, and the rib cage will have fused into a solid mass of bulletproof interlocking plates sitting below where the black carapace will one day also sit. 
In phase three, the next implant is the biscopia. Now this is a small circular organ which is inserted into the chest cavity and releases hormones that increase the muscle growth throughout the neophyte's body. It also serves to form the hormonal basis for many of the later implants. Next up is phase four and the Hetz Masterman. Now this is implanted into the main circulatory system and it is a tiny implant that not only increases the haemoglobin content of the subject's blood, making it more efficient at carrying oxygen around their body and making the subject's blood bright red, it also serves to monitor and control the actions of phase two and phase three implants, although it can be implanted prior to these phases in order for the implants to be more effectively regulated. Next up is the Lahrman's organ. Now this is a liver shaped organ about the size of a golf ball implanted in stage five. And now this implant is placed in the chest cavity and connected to the circulatory system. Now it generates and controls Lahrman cells, which are released into the bloodstream if the recipient is wounded. They attach themselves to the leukocytes in the blood and are carried to the site of the wound, where upon contact with the air, they form a near instant patch of scar tissue, sealing any wounds the space marine may suffer. Now the effectiveness of this organ differs from chapter to chapter, and in fact from marine to marine. Sometimes it can form very hard scabs, and sometimes it can heal wounds almost instantly, although the marines who have this ability are actually more susceptible to mutation and damage because of the rapid healing they undergo. Now phase six introduces the catalepsia node into the neophyte. Now this is implanted into the back of the brain, and it is a pea-sized organ that influences the rhythms of sleep and the body's response to sleep deprivation. If deprived of sleep, the catalepsia node cuts in. The node allows a marine to sleep and remain awake at the same time by switching off areas of the brain sequentially. Now this process cannot replace sleep entirely, but increases the marine's survivability by allowing the perception of the environment even while resting. This can mean that a space marine needs no more than four hours sleep a day and can potentially go for up to two weeks without any sleep at all. However, there are instances where marines have survived far longer without sleep, but I will go into that specifically in their chapter videos. Next up is phase seven and relates to paranormal. Now this is essentially a pre-stomach that can stop otherwise poisonous or indigestible foods. No actual digestion takes place in this organ, and it acts as a decontamination chamber placed before the natural stomach in the body system, and can isolate from the rest of the digestive tract in order to contain particularly troublesome intake. Now the phase eight gland is the amophagia. Now this implant allows the space marine to learn by eating. Now this is a very strange organ, and it is situated in the spinal cord, but is actually part of the brain. Four nerve bundles are implanted and connected to the spine and stomach wall. It is able to read or absorb genetic material consumed by the marine, and the amophagia transmits the gained information to the marine's brain as a set of memories or experiences. Now, it is the presence of this organ which has led to various flesh-eating and blood-drinking rituals which many Astartes are famous for, as well as giving names to chapters such as the Blood Drinkers and famously the Soul Drinkers, whose ability to gain knowledge from eating the brains of their dead opponents was unmatched before they turned rogue. Phase nine actually deals with the multi-lung. Now this is a pretty self-explanatory organ, and it's an additional lung that activates when a space marine needs to breathe in a low oxygen or poison atmosphere, and can even make them breathe underwater. The natural lungs are closed off by an overdeveloped sphincter muscle associated with the multi-lung, and the implanted organ takes over breathing operations. It's a highly efficient toxin dispersal system that acts in tandem with all the other toxin dispersal systems within a space marine's body. Phase 10 is the oculobe. Now this implant sits at the base of the brain and provides hormonal and genetic stimuli which allows a marine's eyes to respond to optic therapy. This in turn allows the apothecaries to make adjustments to the growth patterns of the eye and the light receptive retinal cells. The result being that the space marine's eyes have far superior vision to normal human beings and can see in low light conditions almost as well as in daylight. Now phase 11 is the layman's ear. Not only does this implant make a space marine immune to dizziness or motion sickness, but allows the space marine to consciously filter out and enhance certain sounds. Now the layman's ear completely replaces a marine's original ear, although it is externally indistinguishable from the normal human ear, although it is much larger due to the space marine's larger size. Now, next up is the Sussan membrane, which is phase 12. Now, this is initially implanted above the brain, and this membrane eventually merges with the recipient's entire brain. It is usually ineffective without follow-up chemical therapy and training, but with sufficient training, a space marine can use this implant to enter a state of suspended animation, consciously or as an automatic reaction to extreme trauma, keeping the marine alive for years, even if he has suffered otherwise mortal wounds. Only the appropriate chemical therapy or auto-suggestion can revive a marine from this state. 
and the longest recorded period spent in this suspended animation was undertaken by brother Silas Ur of the Dark Angels, who actually was revived over 567 years after going into suspended animation, which is an incredible length of time, considering what would actually have to happen for a space marine to survive that long. Now, phase 13 is the melanchromatic organ. Now, this implant controls the amount of melanin in a marine's skin. Now, exposure to high levels of sunlight will result in a marine's skin darkening to compensate. It also protects a marine from other forms of radiation, such as alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Now, a mutation of this organ has actually caused the Salamander's space marine chapter to develop almost coal-black skin and very red irises, giving them an almost demonic appearance amongst the human population of their world. However, this sort of mutation is very rare, and only the Salamanders and their subsequent second founding and other chapters actually have any sort of problem with this gland. Phase 14 is the Ulytic Kidney. Now, this, in conjunction with the secondary heart, is an implant that allows a space marine to filter their blood very quickly, which further renders them immune to almost any poison that they can come in contact with. This action comes at a price, however, as the emergency detoxification usually renders a marine unconscious, while his blood is circulated at very high speed. Now, the organ's everyday function is to monitor the entire circulatory system of the space marine and allow other organs to function effectively, making it one of the more important organs in a space marine's body. Phase 15 results in the implantation of the neuroglottis. Now, this enhances space marine's sense of taste to such a high degree that he can identify many common chemicals by taste alone. A marine can even track down his target by taste over bare rock, with some examples cropping up in the surrounding space marine lore. Phase 16 relates to the macranoid organ. Now, this implant allows a space marine to sweat a substance that coats the skin and offers resistance to extreme heat and cold, and can even provide a limited amount of protection against a vacuum. Now, this can only be activated by an outside treatment, and it is common when a space marine is expected to fight in a vacuum or other area which is going to be highly susceptible to heat and or cold. Now, phase 17 is the Batcher's gland, and one of the more famous glands in a space marine's body. Now, this consists of two identical glands implanted either into the lower lip alongside the salivary glands or into the hardened palate. The gland works in a similar way to a poison gland in a venomous reptile by synthesizing and storing deadly poisons, which the marines themselves are immune to due to the gland's presence. This allows marines to spit blinding corrosive poisons and acids. The poisons are so highly corrosive that they can even be used to burn away at certain metals given sufficient time. Phase 18 relates to the implantation of the progenoids near the end of the process. Now, these are two glands which are situated at the back of the neck and within the chest cavity. These glands are vitally important and represent the future of the chapter, as the only way a new gene seed can be produced is by reproducing it within the bodies of the space marines themselves. This is the implant's only purpose. The glands absorb genetic material from the other implanted organs. When they have matured, each gland will have developed a single gene seed corresponding to each of the zygotes which have been implanted into the marine. This can take time, about five years in the first case, ten years in the latter, to mature into a gene seed. The gene seed can then be extracted and used to create more space marines. Now, the final implantation that a space marine will receive at phase 19 is the black carapace, probably one of the most well-known implantations that a space marine will have. Now, it is a most distinctive implant resembling a film of black plastic that is implanted directly beneath the skin of the marine's torso. It hardens on the outside and sends invasive neural bundles into the space marine's body. After the organ has matured, the recipient is then fitted with neural sensors and interface points cut into the carapace's surface. This allows the space marine to interface directly with their power armour. Now, these are all the implanted organs that I need to mention, but that's not the end of the process, because a space marine, after getting the implanted organs, must then undergo a method of training, which allows them to control the organs to a certain degree, although they're never going to have full control over them, as that would be virtually impossible for them to fight. Now, there are several different methods of conditioning that are used. The most common is chemical treatment. Now, until his initiation, a marine must submit to constant tests and examinations. The newly implanted organs must be monitored very carefully and imbalances corrected, plus any sign of maldevelopment being treated. This chemical treatment is reduced after the completion of the initiation process, but never ends. Marines will undergo periodic treatment for the rest of their lives in order to maintain a stable metabolism. Marine power armor suits can contain monitoring equipment and drug dispensers to aid in this if they are caught in the middle of battle. 
Now, the next method of conditioning is hypnotherapy. Now, as the super enhanced body grows, the recipient must learn how to use these new abilities. Some of the implants, specifically the phase 6 and 10 implants, can only function once correct hypnotherapy has been administered. Hypnotherapy is not always as effective as chemical treatment, but can have substantial results. If a marine can be taught how to control his own metabolism, his dependence on drugs is lessened. The process is undertaken by a machine called the Hypnomat. Marines are placed in a state of hypnosis and are subject to visual and oral stimuli in order to awaken their minds to their unconscious metabolic processes. Also, there is of course the traditional training, which is usually physical, and now this stimulates the implants and allows them to be tested for their effectiveness, allowing them to grow and pointing out to their instructors and apothecaries whether or not there is any mutation or problem with the implanted organs. Now finally, the method of conditioning that is used by many chapters is indoctrination. Now just as the body receives the 19 implants, so their minds are altered to release the latent powers within. These mental powers are, if anything, more extraordinary than even the physical powers described above. For example, a marine can control his senses and nervous system to a remarkable degree, and can consequently endure pain that would kill an ordinary man. A marine can also think and react at lightning speed. Memory training is an important part of the indoctrination too. Some marines develop photographic memories. Obviously marines vary in intelligence, as do other men, and their individual mental abilities vary in degree, although many space marines can be considered more intelligent than the standard human being by dint of being space marines. After all these implantations and alterations to the human body, there is a serious debate as to whether or not the space marine is still human. While they still serve humanity, they are at least two metres tall, can breathe poison and eat through metal, which clearly indicates a division between standard humans and the space marines that are now superhuman. Now, whether or not they are post-human is going to be something that will have to be described to us by Games Workshop, but for now, just call them space marines and know that they will protect the Imperium. So that's everything I wanted to talk about today. We're going to be starting another chapter video next week. I haven't decided yet. We're probably going to hold another vote. So if you do want a specific chapter, please vote in the comments below. If you have any questions, queries, or anything else along those lines, don't hesitate to put it in the comments or contact me directly. And as I always say, I hope to see you again soon. Thank you for watching Vaults of Terror.